All right. want to thank you for tuning in to this next episode of the Big Truth Podcast. Before we get into the actual show, I just got to do a little bit of whatever you call it, housekeeping or whatever, and just give a couple of shout outs and uh, talk about a couple of companies that uh, help sponsor this podcast. First off, I want to welcome Chop Cult and uh, thank them for uh, becoming a sponsor of the podcast here. And if you don't know Chop Cult or anything about Chop Cult, the first thing you should do is go to chopcult.com because it is one of the biggest motorcycle or chopper related forums out there. Um, they're a, a, a news resource and social network dedicated to chopper builders and bike riders. And uh, like I said, go to chopcult.com for weekly features. They got a blog dump classifieds and also an active motorcycle related forum. And in that forum, there's so many different subcategories, like whether you need tech advice or you're looking uh to uh, learn how to do something for your to your bike or you know whatever even they got classifieds if you want to buy parts and swap and stuff like that so check them out membership's free so take advantage of that and you can also follow them on instagram facebook twitter tumblr and pinterest at chop cult and then of course we are also sponsored by chopahead.com and uh, Chophead Custom Motorcycles. Follow us at Chophead.com, that is. Uh, we are a custom motorcycle shop. We do everything from oil changes to full chopper or custom motorcycle builds. And, uh, you know, everything in between. Uh, anything you want to do to modify your bike. Performance work. Maintenance. Repair. Do cool shit to it. Whatever. www.chopahead.com or give us a call at 508-995-6764 located in Freetown, Mass. If you wanted to bring your bike to us to have us do something to it. Otherwise, uh, check out our website and uh, buy some swag or buy some parts. And you can also follow us on Instagram at Chopahead and Facebook at Chopahead Customs. Without further ado, we're going to get into it today. My guest is Craig Silverman, a longtime friend. So keep listening. Yes, we have liftoff. I'm here with my boy, Craig Silverman, guitarist extraordinaire. You know him from such bands as Agnostic Front, an American War Machine, of course. <laughs> and uh, he, used to play for, uh, he also used to play for Blood for Blood, Slapshot, Only Live and Witness, Ten and Bray, and probably a whole list of other bands that we haven't uh, got to mention yet. And... Um, and probably a whole list of bands that he's yet to join, but he will, because <laughs> he's a he's a gun for hire in the hardcore scene and uh, in, in metal scene and and uh, everything like that. So, what's going on, Craig? How you doing, yeah. man? Good, great to be here. Yeah, man. Good to see you. Yeah, absolutely. Me and Craig first met what probably the late eighties over at the Rathskeller in Boston. In nineteen, I think it was nineteen eighty six or eighty seven. God damn, we're dating ourselves. I know. Well, yeah, we're old. It's okay. Yeah, years, don't, years don't come off. Yeah, cheers to getting old um, and, and getting older and wiser. Mm. Or was it like the gang green record, older but wiser? <laughs> um, so, yeah, man, what's going on, man? Agnostic Front is touring extremely fucking heavy nowadays. How's that going? Yeah, crazy. Uh, last year was 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 nuts. So uh, last year I, I, I had uh, amicably, amicably left Slapshot in March, I think. Uh, and I was thinking, yeah, this is great. I'm going to be able to spend a little more time at home with my family. It was it was just the right decision. I wound up playing more shows last year <laughs> than I have in my entire career. Uh, and it wasn't supposed to be that way. I'm happy. I mean, it was a great year. Uh, played some <laughs> great, great tours. But, yeah, it, it, it certainly was not supposed to be that way. So I think when... When, when I left Slapshot, like we were talking b b before we uh, we started this, um, <clears throat> it 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 just it, <laughs> both bands kind of like one tour would be offered. It's like, hey, can you do this? No, I'm out with these guys. Okay, great. Can you do this? Then no, I can't because I'm out with those guys. 
So once that was all over, you know, I think Roger, who's responsible for booking everything, all the business, he's like, oh, now he's available all the time. So, <laughs> yeah, man. And then, so you just kicked it up in the overdrive. How many shows did you do, or how many dates did you do uh, last year? Last year, I played two hundred and I think two hundred and thirteen shows. Yeah, out of the three hundred and sixty-five calendar days in mm -hmm. a year, that's a pretty extensive tour. <laughs> and you know, and it's cool, man, because you know, um, Agnostic Front's been doing it since the early eighties and uh it's it's good to see. Do you think some of that also was um was there like a reinvigoration with like the Godfathers of Hardcore coming out? I think uh you know that combined with the new record, uh you know, it it definitely kicked things up a notch. But um <laughs> AF has always toured pretty heavily. Yeah. Um uh you know, last year was crazy, but I've been in the band now for six years. And even bef even before last year, it, it's the touring touring schedule is pretty crazy. Yeah, it seemed like it seemed like sometimes they might take some time off, but once they actually started touring, it was just on. Yeah, it, like, if we're gonna do it, fucking just do it. Yeah, like no matter what, I can always count on it. You know, at least 150 AF shows a year, at least. That's insane. And, and that's such a testament to these guys and their, their, um, their like drive or passion for it because, you know, no one's getting younger. And then those guys were in like the generation before us and they're still yeah. going hard, man. Like yeah, and Roger's got a heart condition, still going hard. Yeah. And, you know, he's in, he's in pretty good health now, yeah. all things considered. Stigma, you know, stigma just, just turned 64 years old. It's, cr <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> 64 is, is just a number with that guy because oh, in yeah. age, he's still in his like 20s and 30s. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and age, energy level, probably health, everything. You know, that guy's going to go on forever. You, you, you'd never know he was 64 years old. No. Every time I tell people how old he is, you're like, what? what? Yeah. Him? And, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just crazy. And so, you know, and it's, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just a, a testament to, the, to, their, to their, you know, dedication to this. And I think it's fucking rad man and so if agnostic front comes to a town near you you better go and don't wait for some asshole to put it on facebook live or something like that <laughs> go there and be there because it's quite an experience and i remember literally one of my favorite shows ever in my life was i don't know i think it was 87 maybe 88 it was agnostic front youth of today um bold but when they were still crippled youth it was so it was crippled youth it wasn't bold and uh, I forgot who else played that. Someone else played it, but that was such an insanity type show. It was, it was at Lupo's in Providence. And uh, that's when there was still like, remember pig piles? Of course. That that died. Like, where did that go? I mean, that was a pig pile. Like, I was literally at the bottom of, of the pig pile in front of the stage. It was so many people. If you don't know, so many people used to stage dive at once that it ended up turning into a pig pile. But it would be like 14 people deep. Mm -hmm. And it was crazy. And I remember being at the bottom of one, not being able to breathe, worried, but also so excited. Just, you know, you know, I'm not going to lie. Back then, you know, I was younger. And when bands came around that you wanted to see, like, you know, I remember me and my friend Ryan, uh, Rio, we, we would be so excited. Like, we couldn't even like, sleep the night before. Like, you know what I mean? You're a teenager. You're all excited. And uh, that was one of those shows I was, like, super, super stoked for. And uh that one and the other, the other one of my other funniest uh, agnostic front stories is when they played at Man Ray, which <laughs> oh yeah with Bruisers <laughs> yeah yeah I, 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 I saw three shows at Man Ray that's that's a story for another day Man Ray Man Ray weird, was weird, like a weird weird place to see a hardcore show yeah well a hardcore <laughs> punk rock show uh, there was other kinds of hardcore shows going on there but it, but it wasn't <laughs> music related no 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 there was a, it was like a weird underground like. Right across Fet yeah, fetish club, di directly across the street from TT the Bears. Yep, and uh, um, in the middle, right near, right across, right down the street from the Middle East. Yeah. And now, um, now they're like really, really nice condos where it once stood, but it was yeah. uh, a weird, weird, yeah. weird spot. So that show, I think Roger just when when it's when Roger just got out of jail. I think it was second or third show after he got out of prison because yeah, the first one was in New York. Yeah, and I think they played in Rhode Island, and I think Boston was the yeah. third one. Yeah, and so, it was, but it was right like the first. Yeah, it was, right one, when it was like out. one of the first four or five. Yeah, and I remember he was sick, and he was talking about it, and he was fucking sweaty, and I'm like, oh, this dude's sick, and he's sweaty, but it's and it's going all over the place. But what I remember most about the Man Ray show is that they had video monitors, 
And at one point they played a video. Now this is the late eighties. Mm -hmm. Like there's no internet. No one's as desensitized to like weird stuff. Like, um, and all I remember is that they played a video on their monitors of a girl having sex with a snake. <laughs> And everyone was so like <laughs> flabbergasted and like amazed by that. Like, has no one ever seen anything like that? Like, there was no right. internet like to look up weird shit, right? And so everyone was looking at that. And Raji got all pissed off. He's like, "Dude, what the fuck?" And he was like, "Told him to shut it off or something." That, and that's like my my best memory of that show. It just makes me laugh. I brought it up to him. He remembered it, but uh, you know that'd probably be a pretty hard one to forget. Yeah. Um, so so let's let's learn a little bit more about you for people that aren't familiar with you, like. You know, I know you, you're you're a veteran of the uh, the music scene, uh, metal and hardcore and punk and stuff. And what what got you into this? Well, these types of music. You know, like what was what was kind of your pathway to getting here? So my cousin Scott was about eight eh, eight or nine years older than me, and you know he was a he was a, a biker, pretty serious one. Uh, and he was into all like new wave of British heavy metal bands. Uh, when I was a little kid, I was what, uh, 11, 12 years old, introduced me to he, like, Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, Motorhead, uh, Samson, Diamond Head. And then, uh, you know, I, I was 12. He's like, hey. I'm going to take you to see a band called Venom. This is 1983. Yeah, man. Uh, Paramount Theater, Staten Island, New York. Like, yeah, if you, you like Judas Priest, you like Motorhead, you're going to love these guys. You're going to love them. And a, a, a tiny band called Metallica opened. <laughs> um, it's yeah. pretty awesome that you got to see Metallica yeah, open, open for open somebody. Open for Venom. Yeah. So they I remember played, seeing flyers like back... Not that quite early, but like later flyers, like you know, you know, used to get like the papers that like have all the shows coming up for clubs. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing Metallica, and like, like man, like I was too punk rock for that at the time. And now, have, like, that's one of the biggest things I kicked myself in the ass for. Is like, man, I could go see them at clubs. Yeah. So b before I got into like you know punk or hardcore, like uh, you know, I was just twelve year old kid. Uh, so the Metallica opening for Venom. 1983, 12 years old. It, I was floored. Yeah, like, man. this is insanity. That's your first show. That was the very first show I ever went to. Yeah, that's a fucking great one, yeah. man. And then one month later, I saw Virgin Steel open for Manowar at the same place, uh, Paramount Theater in Staten Island. And then, uh, then I started going to shows pretty regularly. Um, but like the first hardcore punk show I ever went to was, uh, ironically, was Agnostic Front. At CBGB, it was like uh, either March or April of 1984, Death Before Dishonor, like the original Death Before Dishonor. The like New York, the, yeah, the New York, the New York one. Uh, like my cousin Scotty took me to see that. I, that was the most frightened I think I had ever been in my life up to that point. <laughs> was, what, what, why, was what, at that show, it was just I felt safer outside with all like the like drug addicts, scumbag freaks. Yeah. When I got in there, like, I just want to go outside. I'd rather be outside. <laughs> <being> here. <laughs> that's what I, you know, that's one of the things that I always think is interesting about, uh, shows and you, and you know, like not to be again, the, you know, it's not a, you know, um, not to be like, Oh, when I was a kid, blah, blah, blah. But it's one thing people don't remember. Like, Shit used to be dangerous. Oh yeah. It used to be dangerous. <laughs> at, like I say, it used to just be dangerous to get to the fucking show. Like I remember we used to, uh, we went to see Underdog. Forgot who else played, and it was actually Sam Black Church's first show, and they played uh, in Jamaica Plain, Green Street Station at Green Street mm -hmm. Station, and I remember just Project Kids throwing fucking bricks at us, mm -hmm. and it's just like, well, that's and that's the shit you dealt with just trying to get to the show. Never mind when you got to the show and things were a little more fucking rowdy, you know what I mean, and rough and tumble, and uh, yeah, like my first New York show was. Um, I took a bus, me and my friend, Pat Burke, we took a bus to New York when we were 16. Uh, and we went to see Sheer Terra open for the Nihilistics at CB's. And that was, that was a pretty, pretty rowdy one. <laughs> Nihilistics weren't like the most positive, uh, no, no, positive force in, no, in I, punk rock. <laughs> I, saw, I, I saw them a few times myself. Yeah. 
<laughs> so before we get too far away, man, I, I need to hear a little bit more about this Venom and Metallica show. Yeah, it's like the, just nuts. So like as a 12-year-old kid, um, and this is obviously pre-internet and uh, uh, like – MTV was a fairly new thing, but you know, MTV, you didn't see, yeah, they play like a Judas Priest video here and there, but you know, not like a band like Venom. So what I loved about them as a 12 year old kid and, you know, obviously just starting to rebel against parents, authority, whatever. Like, so like everybody's talking about like this backwards masking and like, is this are these bands like Satanists or whatever? They 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 didn't hide it at all. Like, like goats' heads with blood dripping all over the place, upside down crosses. It's like they didn't hide it. Yeah, <laughs> they were all about it, and I loved it. Yeah. Uh, but for me, Metallica was uh, they uh, they stole the show for me. Um, so it must have been a pretty rowdy set. Like th that's what I remember I, hearing about their old shows were pretty rowdy when it was still club shows. Yeah, and uh, well, th like this was um, I think Paramount Theater. It's been gone for a long time now, but uh, oh, so it was a little bigger. Yeah, I think I think it was like maybe eight or nine hundred capacity. Yeah, but it's packed. <laughs> but um, like they were uh, like jeans, t-shirts. Like, no nonsense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like uh, and, thrash Metallica. Yeah, and I'd never seen uh, uh, anything like that before because at that time, everybody had an image. Like, no sure. matter what they were, it could be an MTV band like Loverboy. Yeah. Like, everybody looked like something. They didn't look like anything. They looked like kids that I saw at the mall when yeah. I was a little kid. Yeah. Those were the guys like that hung out like in the food court <laughs> trying to pick up girls. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and then your second show was Man of War, and then all that Man went away. That went oh, away, yeah. and, and, and there was a lot of pomp and pageantry and, and, around that one. And, and Virgin <laughs> Steel, Long Island's own Virgin <laughs> Steel. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Like, it's, it's, and in some incarnation, aren't Man of War still kicking around? <sighs> Supposedly, they have retired. Oh, okay. But they've, they have since played uh, a few shows. A few shows. Yeah, I, I don't the, think they'll ever retire. Yeah. Well, <laughs> sometimes I think... I think people intend to retire, but they just can't really get it out of their blood. And it's like, wait, and then when you're tired, well, then what are you going to fucking do, right? That's why I think it's 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 wise to just not ever say this is the last one. Just yeah. just ride it out. Yeah, the, the who ruined that for everyone thirty years ago, right? You know, I like, remember. <laughs> yeah, okay, so so like, like most of you listening are probably way too young to remember. There was a cable station, the very first one. It was called WHT. Before you know, HBO, Showtime, it was like uh, like uh, Wametco Home Television or whatever it was called. But uh, I was lucky enough to catch the Who's farewell tour at my <laughs> friend Danny White's house. It was in nineteen was it eighty or eighty one? Um, uh, like that that was supposedly their last show ever. Yeah. And yet they still played a few months ago. Yeah, <laughs> it's in 1981 was a long time ago. But I remember watching that live and being floored because I loved The Who when I was a kid. Yeah. You know what? Something that just made me think of when, <laughs> when you talked about early days of MTV. I remember one thing that really, and it still sticks out in my head, and I, I don't think I've ever seen the video since, but when I was a kid, I remember seeing a Kraut video for a song all twisted. I saw the 120 minutes. Yeah, and I was like, damn, this is fucking good. And I remember that was like like super, like when I saw it, I was like, damn, that's what the fuck is that? And then, you know, never seeing it again. And uh, But I, I still remember it to this day. Like, I just remember the video because it looked cool. Like, And they were all just like, they just looked like regular. They were just wearing like cut off fucking t-shirts and fucking, you're all twisted, you know? That's so good. That's that's the, the, the best thing about MTV uh, was 120 minutes yeah. uh, because- like every Sunday night, like I remember dreading having to go to school the next day. But, you know, I'd stay up late and watch 120 minutes every night. And it was such a thing. They, like you'd see videos from, you'd see Cro-Mags, you'd see yeah, Echo yeah. and the Bunnymen, Smiths, Swans, of uh, uh, Kraut. Like you'd see hardcore, yeah. punk, metal, uh, industrial <laughs> what? But I never saw a Swans video, 
but I can't even imagine what a fucking Swans video would be like. Uh, and uh, I haven't heard the Swans probably since I was like 16, and a friend of mine, Johnny Cosmos, had a record, and I remember him playing it, and me and my friend Ryan go, what the fuck <laughs> is this? And I might look at it now with, like, with different ears, you mm. know, but as a 16-year-old like punk rock kid, I was like, what the fuck is it? It just sounded like... Yeah, I, I, I loved all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, <I was> like, <laughs> 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 that's like, when I think of the Swans, that's all I can hear, but I, it probably doesn't sound anything like that, but no. that's all I remember was like super droning like something but, like if it wasn't for 120 minutes i never would have well i eventually would have heard the cult yeah. but like that was my first exposure to bands like that sure and not only um 120 i do remember 120 minutes but even more something that resonated with with me was on us i think it was usa up all night and network oh, night, night flight night flight, night flight on usa that network was, that was fucking great that's where i first saw another state of mind yep uh, it, and then, yeah, they would play movies. They would yeah. play videos. That's where I first saw Blast Surf and Destroy video. <laughs> I haven't ever, probably haven't seen it since then, but I was a kid and I remember seeing that going, yes, fucking whatever that is. Fuck yeah, dude. I want that. Like, I want, I want to be part of that. I want to be involved in that. And, uh, and that song still like resonates with me. Like, like it's weird because like the first part of the song, it's like actually two songs connected. And mm -hmm. the first part, I'm like, yeah, whatever. But when it kicks in to surf and destroy, I don't even fucking surf. But like, when that kicked in, <laughs> I was like, fuck yeah, dude, that's, that's so fucking good. Yeah, it's like a, a but man, it's, it's so great night flight. It's like a, a, a decline of Western civilization. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like that's where I saw my yeah. first Black Flag videos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. TV Party. They yeah. had a video for TV Party. The Suicidal had a video mm -hmm. for Institutionalized. I'm trying but, uh, to, it was awesome. Yeah, Black Flag. yeah. Um, another state of mind, like, I remember, like, it's so funny. Uh, I'm not even going to get into it because it'll get me in trouble, but <laughs> I just remember being fully enamored with the, and so stoked to see Minor Threat practicing in the basement of like the, the DC house. But I was totally unimpressed with some other guys that are major icons oh, in the man, punk rock too. scene. Me too. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. I'm not going to go. I, yeah. I but whatever. But you know, but I love the movie, but you know, and you got to think too, all of them were still kids at that time. Oh, you know, yeah, they were I, just a little bit older than yeah. us, but you know, they were still kids. All right. So, so your cousin got you kind of into getting into, brought you around and, Got you, first introduced you to the Judas Priest, and then the the Motorhead is always kind of like a good crossover to kind of in, see uh, yeah. a litmus test. If you like this, then you're probably gonna like some more aggressive stuff. And then he got you into some of that stuff, or your first exposure to that. And then and then then and then he brought you to your first couple of shows. And then then what happened? So, you know, after after I saw Agnostic Front in 1984, that's when I kind of like veered off a little bit from the metal stuff. No, I love metal, but uh, you know, then I discovered bands like Discharge, um, <clears throat> GBH, yeah, and you know Bad Brains, which completely changed everything for me. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you know, I kind of found a way to to mix them all together. I hate to use the word crossover because it's a silly term. Any band that I've ever been in, I've mixed the two genres together. Sure. Because there's there's there was never any difference to me other than lyrical content, maybe what people looked like. It wasn't music for normal people, it was underground stuff. It wasn't Yeah, uh, man. So like a, an underground metal band was no different to me than an underground hardcore punk band. Yeah. Like, this is not like music for, for, for the average person. Sure, yeah. No, no, and, and I totally got that, and I, I just ended up being more exposed to the punk rock side of things. For I mean, when I was a kid, you know what I mean? I was all like, you know, Motley Crue, Shout at the Devil, and all that stuff when I was in middle school, and then, then I found punk rock uh, or hardcore or whatever through, like, my local college radio station and got just more identified with that. And then later, I think what really started more of bringing me back the crossover stuff, you know, obviously... Always still liked Motorhead. Always got a pass from everybody, um, but I just remember the days where like there were like metal dudes and hardcore dudes. But in metal dudes, there was like I don't know what you'd call it, like more like the mainstream metal dudes. Mm. They might like Metallica, but they the next day they might have a docking shirt on. 
You know what I mean? <laughs> or like a winger shirt. You know what I mean? But yeah. the Metallic was it. It always seemed like I was getting into fist fights with those dudes. And then some of them might even <laughs> maybe like, you know, the guy that went out on a limb a little would have a, like a Slayer shirt or something. But I always end up fighting those dudes. But like the underground dudes, like it, we all got along, but it was like, there was like a, like the burner metal head dudes we never got along with. And so later it all kind of, in the crossover days when DRI stopped from the Dirty Rotten LP to, to the crossover, crossover LP. Yeah. Then, Four you know, of a kind and then and it, yeah, stuff. then everything kind of merged a little bit more. And now, like I say, like hardcore to me, like most new hardcore just sounds like metal, but it's with guys with short hair. Oh, and, it is. You know what I mean? Uh, 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 and uh, uh, even more so you got kids with long hair. They look like a thrash band from 1988. Some yeah. of these hardcore yeah, bands Yeah, now. yeah, yeah, It's true. But, uh, yeah, uh, and it's cool. It's all, yeah, no, it's hey, all, it's all, a, yeah, it's hate, all a mesh. You know hate to mean? sound like the old guy, but it's true. Like you, you, like now you got like hardcore bands. These kids like wearing jams. You got long hair. So yeah, yeah. Wow, this is like a 1989 thrash band. Well, you got to think it's like a throwback, right? Like, totally. You know, like. But everything goes and everything goes in cycles. They, I, I, the chophead has the chophead thing under the brim as an homage to suicidal, which was <laughs> before us. You know what I mean? And, and, and some kid now is like looking at that old stuff and is like getting into that and that's what they're into. That's their path yeah, or whatever. They like that, like that docking stuff. I, I totally, I missed all that stuff. Yeah. I never got into that stuff because you know, I got into like the underground. real heavy metal stuff. Yeah. 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 Early on, very early 1980s. Yeah, Doc and no. they're great for what they are, but and, yeah, I didn't like. You know, but I, I think that the guys that liked those bands, they liked them because that was their way of getting to hook up with girls because girls actually went to see those bands. Yeah. Like, no girls went to see bands that I went to see. Sure. Like, like now it's the, the funniest thing, and I still talk about this to this day. Like, now you got, like, you know, girls go to see hardcore shows like this was like, this never happened like the only girls that went to hardcore shows when i was a kid were like skinhead girls that looked like dudes yeah. that would beat the fucking piss out of you there was that there was some <laughs> like skater girls there, there was some punk right there was a couple there, it was just they were there it was just much less numbers maybe than now yeah, they didn't look like the girls that went to see Dawkins. <laughs> no but you, you like it was weird because you gotta think too which is different now uh uh from back then is that like metal or like watered down metal was top 40 back then yeah and like you know the dude with a rockin with docking shirt was also wearing z, z cavaricis or yeah. zubas riv, driving an i rock z28 yeah. you know what i mean with his with his oakley blades on and uh and calling us faggots when he oh, drove yeah. by us oh, and then, yeah. then we would fucking he didn't realize we all had fucking mad balls with us or like <laughs> we weren't beyond lighting up a pizza box and throwing it in his his t-tops that were good old open. days yeah that a lot of a lot of days outside of clubs were, were, was doing that type of uh, mm -hmm. sh shenanigans as well. Mm -hmm. um, shout out to the jerk <laughs> squad. Um, but um, but anyway, you know, uh, so so you started uh, going to more shows and getting more involved and what you know, and then what we're I don't even know where we left off. We keep going on sidetracks, which That's which fine. are interesting, but. Uh, your cousin started bringing you to the shows and then you started, and then you started finding yeah, more of the, yeah. I know you mentioned the, the old British punk and, 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 and hard stuff. Yeah. Like then that. I just, I went off on my own. Uh, and you know, I, I, I went to, until I moved up to the Boston area, you know, I, I, then I just started going to CBGB every Sunday for matinees. Um, and then, uh, moved up to Boston and. Started, started going doing to the, the same. Yeah. <laughs> Just went to the rat and ground zero and yeah. uh, uh ground zero. We played ground zero, my old band. We played there with um who did we play with? It was an we played with the anti heroes there. Oh yeah? It was an Oi Fest and they just put us on for some reason. I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> we were the token hardcore band on the Oi Fest. It was uh it I was like that club. Anti heroes and forced reality. Love forced reality. Um I mean, we always get along like with, with like, you know, I was fucking Blitz is still in my top Blitz uh, voice of a generation, still my top five records of all time. Record. You know what I mean? Like, um, but, uh, but yeah, man. So when did you move to the Boston area? Uh, 1980, was it 88, 1988. Okay. And then, uh. Only Live and Witness didn't start too, too much longer after that. 89. Yeah. So it didn't take you long to kind of get into a band that became a no. 
kind of mainstay of late eighties and early nineties Boston hardcore or uh, metal hardcore, both, yeah, both, <laughs> both. Well, that was cool because because you know bands like that, like you guys could play. You had a whole array of shows open to you. Yeah, we um outside of it, it was cool in Boston, but outside of New England, it was so weird for us because we we would get put on like metal shows, hardcore shows, and just people would just stand there with their arms crossed and yeah. like stare at us. Yeah, <laughs> and those are the dudes that have paid hundred dollars for a record now. Yeah, <laughs> but it's nuts. It's like, yeah, uh, uh, but like the the first first time we were really accepted is when we uh. Uh, we opened for uh, 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 Prong and Coc at the Channel. Well, that's a good lineup. That's yeah. that makes that's a lineup that makes sense at that time because that was right when Coc put uh, uh, they were touring for Blind. Yeah, uh, and that was the first time in Boston that we were actually accepted by a by a full crowd. Yeah, like yeah, these we get it, I guess, <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, in the states, Did you guys play with Wolgasm? Uh, I, I, I was in a thrash band before Only Living Witness called Formicide. We played with Wargasm all the time. Okay, but by the time uh, Only Living Witness is doing our thing, Wargasm was already kind of slowing down. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. So only you guys probably played with Maelstrom sometimes, yeah. <laughs> every now and then. Yep. <laughs> Megamorphosis. A couple times. <laughs> a couple times. Um, but yeah, so, so well, how did you get into uh, playing guitar then? Um, so it, it was actually, actually by accident. So when I was a kid, like I wanted to be Gene Simmons. Who didn't? From exactly. our age stage, right? right? It's like Gene Simmons was the guy in Kiss you wanted to be. So I wanted to play bass. And I eventually wound up being a bass player. Um. So, you know, I asked for a guitar. I know, I'm sorry. Sorry. I asked for a bass. And then I got a guitar. I'm like, this isn't what he plays. <laughs> like, he plays the one with four strings. This is the one with six strings. I was, you know, old enough to get that. Yeah, yeah. Like, <sighs> so for a while, I took the top two strings off. Which is really the ones you'd probably want to keep. Right. Yeah. But, you know, we'll chalk it up to, to youth. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I just started learning, like, the bass lines. Like, sticking my tongue out, putting ketchup packets, <laughs> and, like, spitting them all over the place trying to be Gene Simmons. <laughs> is there any video or, or film of this? Oh, there's got to be. You I'm sure. There, I have pictures. I have yeah. pictures. I don't know about film. I have a picture of me from Halloween, which is probably in the late seventies or mid to late seventies. Um, and remember those, like the shitty costumes you'd get where it was like a plastic mask and like the shirt pants thing. <laughs> well, I had a Gene Simmons kiss one oh, yeah, and too. my father has a picture of me and him and I'm like in that and I'm, but I'm throwing the horns with both hands up. I'll, I'll find that. It was like plastic mask. Oh, like horrible. Shitty hair. Just, yeah. You could, you could, <laughs> you could very, you could just see a little bit and all you did was sweat in it. Uh, Cooper, Cooper's town or something. Cooper or something, I think is like who made all those. It was, I remember the box. I forget. Yeah. No, Cooper's town is where the baseball no, hall the, of fame is. But it was called like Simon. Cooper or something like that. I remember. I, for, I forget, but I, I mean, I had, uh, because like, my brother, who's a nut, collects all this shit, and he has all those old costumes, um, all of them. But uh, yeah, I was Gene Simmons one year. I was Ace Fraley another. But yeah, I used to like pour those ketchup packets. My mouth was <laughs> <just>, like. <laughs> <laughs> you should bring that back for for Agnostic Front. <laughs> so just fun. put just put on a show. Just put on a show. Man. I know. You to entertain uh, the people. I right? have stigma to it. Yeah, man. That's his job. I uh I wish uh see you in the I don't know, it must have been the early nineties, my friend date my friend Shane dated a girl, um, and her her father was the lighting guy for Kiss. And he had some of their like gold records and stuff. Oh really? And he had a pair of Ace Freely's boots from back in the day. Yeah, that's just the heel. And then add like fucking thirty <laughs> inches and that like above that, you know what I mean? Um, but uh 
But yeah, so I've I've actually tried to try on a pair of Ace Freely's boots, but my feet were too big. So, but yeah, just just go to bed being jealous of that tonight. Well, just all like, those guys are little. I will. They're all little, <laughs> except for Gene Simmons. Gene Simmons is like a taller guy, but the rest of them are all tiny. Yeah, yeah. That's why you don't. You know, this is this is so this is, this is a whole big aside, but. It is funny being a kid, right? And you see all these guys and you think they're going to be fucking mammoths. Like, and, and the, the funniest one I ever had was um, uh, in 98, I lived in, I believe it was, yeah, it was 98. I lived in Atlanta for a year. I was working at the Centers for Disease Control. And, <laughs> and uh, a friend of mine was his DJ and he ended up becoming the DJ for Public Enemy that took the place of Terminator X. His name was DJ Lord. Oh, really? Awesome guy, like a really good guy. And he lived near me and I'd, I'd just hang out at his house every day. And this was right around the time he was getting recruited for Public Enemy. So uh, prof- um, well, Professor Griff used to come to his house, his apartment. And I remember Public Enemy from when I was a kid, so I think Professor Griff, Public Enemy, S1Ws, this guy's gonna be a fucking beast. Like, like he like came up to like the middle of my chest, and I remember just looking at him, being, "Damn, dude, I could fucking smash you." But like, it was like my first time being like, "Oh, these dudes really aren't." You know, you when you're a kid, you make things larger than life. Oh yeah. And then when you see the reality of it later, it's it's it doesn't always match up. Now, now nothing against Greg. He was a great. He was actually a really nice guy, even though he got in a lot of trouble back in the day for saying, I don't know, whatever inflammatory yeah. things or something. But you know, he was a nice enough guy and everything. But it was just it was just really bizarre. You know, you, you see some of these guys and you're like, God oh, damn, dude. Yeah. yeah. There 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 are so many, so many people like that that I've, you know, met and am friends with over the years, I could see them in fanzines uh, and like, you'd see them on stage. Yeah. And then when you actually meet them, you're like, yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Wow. <laughs> I still remember being freaked out by Pusshead, and, and it's, it's <laughs> literally, I never, I've never met the guy in real life. I would I'd like to just cause he's, you know, uh, a good artist, an influential artist yeah. to me. And he, Puss's own um, articles in Thrasher magazine in the late eighties, like helped, shaped the course of my life a little bit. And um, there was a picture of him playing with septic death and he had some weird fucking mask on and there was only one eye hole cut out of it and stuff. And he just looked like a fucking maniac. And I was like, what the fuck is this? And then I went and bought a septic death record and I was like, yeah, it pretty much matches the picture. You know what I mean? But I never met him in real life, but I, I don't know. But that was just one that still like as a 48 year old man, that still sticks out in my head. It's like, yeah, that dude looked like a fucking savage. You know what I mean? Like, and that's like literally probably from when I was like 15 years old, 16 years old, you know? And, um, uh, and uh, yeah, I don't know. No, but but it's it, it's it's so so true. Uh, of like I, I won't mention any names, but like there was there was one time in particular where you know, I, w- I was under the impression that this person was like a fucking giant because you'd see pictures like massive, like wow. Then I met him in person. I'm like, holy fuck, You're like a child. <laughs> 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 Wait, does it rhyme with Smithfits? Something like that. <laughs> and I saw him not all that long ago, and it's still the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I was at um, the first, uh, one of the first dancing shows, and um, it was me and uh, uh, Ryan, and it was, it, was a, it was a bunch of us there. And, um, was it like 87 or something? First Danzig record? Yeah. I think it was 88. Well, the first show, well, it was like a Christmas night show at, in Providence. And it was Danzig at the living room or something like that. And uh, I, was, I wasn't there. Yeah. And I just remember, yeah, it was 88 because I was 16. And I um, I just remember being so, now, now and not shortly after that, I actually really liked the first Danzig record. I liked the first two Danzig records a lot. I just wasn't ready for it because this is again pre-internet. No one knows what the hell's going on. You just know Glenn Danzig from the Misfits and Sam Hain or so on or however you want to pronounce it has a new band that's just called Danzig. You're gonna go see it, right? And then I remember he came out in like a little mesh half shirt and all this and that, and I was just looking up, going, "What the fuck is going on?" I just wasn't ready for it. It was a little too far ahead of of where I was. You know what I mean? Like. Admittedly, back then I was, you know, I liked more aggressive punk and hardcore. We all did. You know what I mean? And in the metal, everything, everything I liked was more aggressive, and so I wasn't ready for that. 
And, um, and I remembered, so I was like, all right, so I'm just going to fucking antagonize them because that's, cause that's, that's what a punk rock kid does. So I made little dumb signs like play bullet and shit like that. And so I just kept hang, handing shit out, hanging shit up. And he was like, getting, hey, throw that kid out, throw that kid out. Yeah. But he was, he was progressively getting more aggravated. And then at one point, he was, they actually played Halloween. And I was so aggravated that I jumped up and I just grabbed the mic out of his hand and I started singing it. And then like I remember his manager or something came out and then he started like 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 huffing and puffing and like putting his chest out and stuff. And I'm like, all right, I'll fight you, dude. I'm 16, but I'll fucking fight you, man. Like, let's fucking do it. And then his manager was like, fuck you, motherfucker, you fucking blah, blah. and you know, whatever. And then, and then I got escorted out or whatever. But um and it's funny because I got escorted out by people I ended up working with a few years later as a doorman. You know what I mean? But that's what, some of my funnest memories of being getting kicked out by Greg Lee, uh, you know, rest in peace, and some other guys that still, like, like stayed in the, the bounce in the doorman game, and then later I ended up working with them, and they were like, yeah, I remember fucking... But they always liked me because when I was getting thrown out, I was always cool to them. I go, all right, I know you're doing your job. And I just would walk out, like, you know what I mean? Well, yeah. And you know what I mean? Like, I knew the, the jig was up or whatever, you know what I mean? Um, but, yeah, I... Like, I was never a huge Misfits fan. I like... Ca very casual Misfits fan. I like, like, six of their songs. But I loved Sam Hain. Did you? Yeah, I did. No, I, I liked him. I was I was more <clears throat> of a Misfits fan. But I'm like the unpopular one where I did like all the early stuff. But Earth AD is the one that resonated with me. Like I fucking still love that record. I haven't listened to it in a while. Now I'm gonna go listen to it. But it was a f just them being super aggressive. Um, and that song Earth AD and stuff was yeah. fucking good, man. You know what I mean? And Wolf's Blood. Wolf's Blood is on that one, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's what, that's what I was just saying. Yeah. Those were fucking great songs. But um, so, yeah. So you started, uh, so you, you wanted to get into the bass, but you got given a guitar by mistake. So yes. you tried to make the guitar into a bass. Into a bass. And, and then, then you I, started learning chords. Then I just started playing guitar. I was like, yeah. it's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so you could have started a new trend if you just would have stuck with it. Yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> it's like the, yeah, the, what was that awful 90s band uh, guitar player played with two strings? Well, I don't uh, remember that. Of, of, of Presidents of the United States of America. I remember the name of that horrible, band. horrible band. I can't remember the band. I remember the name. But the, uh, the guitar player just had the bottom two strings. That's all he played with. And he was the only guitar player? Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, that, that had to be a... They had a couple of radio hits. I can't remember what they are off the top of my head. But uh, yeah, so like after a year, like this isn't going to work. It's, it's, it doesn't feel right. It's not a bass. I'll just play guitar. So I played guitar for a few years, then switched to bass, then eventually went back to guitar. What, did you play bass in any bands? A uh, bunch. Okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but like nobody that's... You know, no, no, anybody would, aside from a band called the Shods. I remember the Shods. Yeah, okay. But uh, like, I never got to, that was my passion. I love bass. I love playing bass. And I wish that I could play bass in a band. <laughs> like, if I had my choice. Really? Yeah. It's my main instrument. I mean, that's well, a bass player. You're known as such a good, <clears throat> you know, like good heavy hitting guitarist. Like precise. Like That comes from playing bass because it's like, it's a, a, you pick like a bass. I, I play it percussively. It's yeah. I'm not kind to the guitar. Like you're not supposed to be kind to the bass. You have to yeah. oh, play. Sure. Yeah. 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 Play with a drummer. Yeah. So when I play guitar, it's the same thing. Like that's, that's how I play. So you have a good string sponsor. Yeah. yeah yes, good. I do. <laughs> <laughs> good. Good. Uh, yeah. No, no, I remember. Cause when I've, I, when I was a kid, I played bass too. And I remember just, the bass being the most in, misunderstood person uh, instrument by people that didn't play bass. They're like, what the fuck is that? Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> well, like, yeah, the bass is, is like most, uh, in most bands, the bass player will follow the guitar player, which to me is complete insanity. The bass player and the drummer are supposed to lock in. Yeah. Um, so the bass is, it's percussive. I mean, you're supposed sure. to follow the drummer. You, play hit um and that's how i play guitar and it's because i was a bass player before i was a guitar player i guess okay so your advice to all new guitar players go play the bass for a little while right and then come back don't be kind to your guitar 
<laughs> and uh, yeah, especially if you're playing, you know, it's one thing if you're playing Arthur, uh, uh, Arlo Guthrie uh, folk right. music, but if you're going to be in the heavy genres, smash that. Yes. Um, but yeah, like, you know, one thing, that's why I always liked, I think, uh, um, COC Animosity is one of my all-time oh favorite my God, records. such a good record. Just the, the it's it's two things on that. Just the the t- like the recording of the record, the production of it, the the ridiculous bass that Mike Dean was playing, and the growly, distorted vocals. It's fucking a perfect storm, and I wish they would fucking tour and do that record. I know it's it's a little. Uh, Didn't they though? It was not too long ago, like in the last five years. N- I thought they did. I thought they did too, but it was it was it wasn't it wasn't that. It was blind or something. Like it was something. Later, or maybe it was technocracy or something. Maybe technocracy. Blind, they. I love that record. Uh, <laughs> I know it's not popular for a lot of people our age that got into them early on, yeah. but Blind, it's a, it's a great record. No, you know what I do? I I love it all. I just think of it as two different bands. Well, they are. It's like it's like Black it Sabbath is. with Ozzy and Black Sabbath with Dio. Yeah, they were completely completely different bands. Yeah. Um. But you know, even though it was like mostly the same members, which yeah. was great, which was great, you know yeah. what I mean. But I mean, a, a, a blind and deliverance, like those records are, they're great, but they're they're not, you know, animosity, right? <laughs> and it's weird because you really see it, like, because really, eye for an eye, isn't isn't animosity. Animosity isn't technocracy, but you can see kind of the progression of where they were kind of heading with it. So they, a, a lot of people that I know, when especially when when Blind came out, like totally just uh, 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 turned their backs on COC. And it's like it's, uh, it's metal. It's like, have you not been paying paying attention? Like, there's always been a tinge of Black Sabbath there. If you didn't hear it, yeah, you weren't paying attention. Well, it, from did, the beginning, but it's, it's like, always been there. Didn't technocracy tip you off? Like, yeah, you know what it's I mean? Like there's, they have, oh, they, in like St. Vitus, it's the same kind of thing. It's Black Sabbath. That's, oh, yeah, it's yeah. there. Yeah. And, and, <clears throat> and, and I always liked it all too. Like, it was, it, they were one that, like, the progression, like, I was like, all right, it's cool. Like, I, and I still like Deliverance a lot. Like, I still listen Great to that record. all the time, you Great know, record. like, or like <laughs> songs from it all the time. And um, it was just, yeah. But animosity to me is in my, I've I've mentioned a few tonight that are in my top five flawless albums of all time. Like I'll listen to that without skipping a Great track, record. man. Um, and then just like, you know, pray or something. You just think of that bass line coming in. <laughs> and then him singing at the same time. I wish I could have seen him back then. I, I could have, but I, I I just didn't. I think I saw him on like Technocracy era. And they still played some of the, the old mm. stuff. But I wish I would have saw him on that tour, like when they toured Animosity. Because I don't know, it's just one of my biggest regrets not not being there for that. <laughs> yeah, I, Dick, as much as I like them, I didn't see COC until Only Living Witness played with them in the early '90s. As yeah. much as I love them, yeah. Well, I don't feel like they came around a whole hell of a lot. They didn't. Uh, they weren't like a, a a a heavy touring band until later on. Yeah, yeah. They they just kind of picked up steam when they kind of went more in the you know like the the the, the war. Just like heavy rocky yeah. kind of direction. All right, so so then was what was your first band that that you played uh well guitar or bass in? <sighs> A lot, <laughs> but yeah, the no. first the first <clears throat> like real uh, uh, gigging band that I was ever in was Formicide, okay. thrash band. Yeah, we and that was the one right before Only Living with Yeah. Us. And I was what sixteen. Uh, I'd play at Narcissus on like heavy metal Wednesday. Uh, you know, we gigged a lot around Boston, but that was about it. Sure. And then, uh, then only live and witness. And then, kind of uh, after only live and witness, I feel like you went more well. But outside of Tenenbrae, you just kind of ended up just getting right into being more into like hardcore bands and. Yeah, I'm, uh, like after after Only Living Witness, I, I played in country bands, yeah, and, you know, rockabilly bands, and like I just kind of, you know, not a, a, a 
Yeah, a little hiatus from the. Yeah, it's like heavy nobody. Stuff. Like, 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 you're playing in front of two people in yeah. some bar in fucking Swamp Scott. Yeah. <laughs> or, or you're playing like Plowing Stars or yeah. like Abbey Lounge. But, you know, but I was happy doing that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I never took a break from playing. I yeah. just. You just kind of dipped out of the scene for a little while. Kind of started playing, you know, music that I just wanted to play. Sure. And that was it. So when you're when you're at home around like fiddling around or fucking around with your guitar, what do you is that what you do? Do you play a, an array of things like a, a yeah, so styles and like, stuff? Yeah, I have a guitar in every room in my house. So when when I talk to I do a fair amount of touring, and I talk to other musicians. Like yeah, you know, like, 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 I haven't touched a guitar in two months. It's like, really? The, the, there's not a day that goes by that I don't pick up a guitar for at least thirty minutes. I have a guitar in every room in my house. Like walk past it, it's like okay, pick it up, play. Uh, I, it's just, it's like an extension. It's like a body part. I, 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 I can't stop. Sure. So I, I think for for some people. Um, you know, especially people that 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 tour more than than I do. Um, it, it's sad. I think for a lot of these people, it, it just becomes a job, and it's not it's okay. not something they want to do. It's, it's not like, a passion, right? It's like I have to play guitar. It's just it's it's what I do. Yeah. So no, but what I meant is like when you're at home just fucking around and you're going from room to room, mm -hmm. running around with your son. Watching them, like, and you pick up a guitar, are you always, like, what are you doing? Like, are you playing all different styles? Like, you going back and oh, playing yeah. some rockabilly it's, shit? It's, it or doesn't, play? it's, it, it could be anything. Yeah. Uh, and, like, he's to the age now, he's like, hey, daddy, play that song that I like. <laughs> okay, which one? That one. Okay, sure. You know? Nice. And then I'll just run around like an idiot. Yeah. Which is what we do at shows, like as adults or whatever. Um, what, uh, what, yeah. Uh, what, what, um, why, what songs is, it, what, what kind of music does he like? Or what's he, he has, a, like, he's, he, he has a, a, a pretty, uh, a, a, a pretty broad taste now. Sure. But, you know, right now he likes, like, Def Leppard. His, my wife listens to this, whatever radio station it is, it plays the 80s stuff. So he likes, Def Leppard and like Motley Crue is like, yeah, that's my jam. <laughs> like, okay. So I listen to it and then I have to play it for him. But he likes uh, Motley Crue. So there's garbage. That is. Wait, wait, wait. Well, what Motley Crue like? Like, uh, 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 the, I had a uh, theater of pain or later. Um, no, uh, uh Shout the, the, the one that I, I uh, girls, girls, girls is the okay, one that yeah. I had to learn because he likes it. <laughs> <laughs> but not give him a lot of singles, dude, and send them out. No, I was like, whatever, whatever they play on the radio or, yeah, or yeah, like yeah. Def Leppard. He's like, I like that one. Like, all right, so I had to learn Photograph. Photograph, and A couple yeah. other ones. But yeah, he, he likes, he likes 80s stuff. Yeah. For that's now. That's bizarre. Does he get excited when you play the song for him? Oh, yeah. That's cool. Yeah, he runs around like a fool. <laughs> um. <clears throat> You're good, man. So, uh, so, do you ever? How many bases do you have? Uh, three. Okay. Mm. Uh, I have two Fender Precisions, and I have a Hofner, an Epiphone Hofner copy. Are they out? Do you ever pick those up? Yes, I do. Uh, not the Hofner copy because it's a. That's um, that's a very uh. Of, of like kind of specific, like if you're going to play Beatles covers, sure. Like that's the bass that I played when I was in the Shads. Very like perfect for a band like that. Yeah. But like the, the P basses. Yeah. They're great. You ever play uh did you ever branch out to the stand up bass? I tried. Um, it's a, uh, it, it's a different, it's a different feel. Um, sure. Playing a, a, a stand-up bass, I, I can't describe it, but like even plucking and fretting, it's that's something that you really have to work at sure. to get good at it. Yeah, I was gonna say it seems like a big, uh, like a big, like jump. It is. I mean, you could be the best bass player in the world, but like switching to that stand-up because you gotta so, like the attack on the strings, everything about it is different. It's it's not a bit. It's it's a bass technically, I guess, but it's. Yeah. It's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, and and it's 
it's not even the same position or anything. You no, know everything I mean? about it's different. I mean, the the, the strings are like yeah, that yeah. high off the neck. I mean, you have to. It takes a lot of work. I did try. Yeah, I just, just I, wasn't, I wasn't good at it. And more importantly, <laughs> the guitar. Did you ever pick up the guitar? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm going to tell your son, because he's getting into 80s, and you better get one. I want a guitar in every room. Yeah, he, 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 it, 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 we had a, uh, in, in Medford at the Whole Foods, Whole Foods right up the street from us, the, the, the guitar bear, which is, like, that guy's gotten himself in a little bit of trouble recently, I guess. But, uh, like, he loved him. He's like, guitar bear, this guy rocks. I, I don't know what the key tar, Oh, I don't even. You can look it up on the internet. <laughs> but like the Massachusetts key tar bear has gotten himself into a little bit of trouble. Oh boy, is he on some like uh, some lists or directories or something that type of trouble? Uh, Does he show up on an app of people you don't want as your neighbors? <laughs> <laughs> he's he's had some problems, but my son, well, at least used to adore him. Yeah. But, the key top bear. <laughs> Maybe you should bring it back. Yeah. I'd, I'd get into that suit. The guy's got to do is just play like a few songs, like wear that stupid outfit and play some human league songs right. or something. Yeah. Um, so yeah, man. So, you know, um, when did you transition? Cause I know for a lot of years you, you worked, um, you know, as a, as a bartender or the, in that type of service industry and stuff, like when were you able tra to transition to a full-time <laughs> musician and what was that transition like? It was, you know, like, cause one of the things I like to f talk about on these is that, you know, obviously it's fucking awesome to follow your passion and follow your dreams and do what you love. Um, and you know, everyone says do that, but people aren't always prepared to say, yeah, but you also have to make these sacrifices to do those type of things and stuff. And so, you know, I like to talk to people a little bit about like, you know, how they got to be able to do their passion as their full-time job, but also kind of the pros and cons of things that entailed that, that came with it. And like, what were maybe some of the unexpected things that came with that? You know what I mean? Um, so like I managed, uh, 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 bars, restaurants, nightclubs for a very long time. Um, very lucrative career. Sure. Um, especially f like what you were doing, like was like entertainment, like a, like a, or like rentals and stuff. Like it yeah, wasn't just like, it wasn't like being in a bar. No, it was like, I, I, I did everything. Yeah. Uh, and it had gotten to a point where, you know what? I just don't want to do this anymore. Uh, uh, it didn't matter how much money I was making. Uh, you know, I was making six figures a year. I, I did really well. And, and that was like more like part time too, right? Yeah. I, I never worked a 40 hour work week ever yeah. in my life. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> at a traditional job, right? No, being but, on the road is, yeah, but that's different. Yeah. But I mean like a, a real job. I never worked 40 hour work week Yeah, ever. Uh, besides, like, working construction when I was a kid. Sure, sure, yeah. But in my adult life, never. Uh, and, you know, it just got to the point, it's like, you know what? I just don't want to do this anymore. Uh, I don't owe anybody any money, I mean, aside from my mortgage. Sure. But I always make sure that I hold up my end no matter what. Um, and you know, it's, like, now I get to do what I love, I don't make a lot of money and it sucks to be away from my family, but I do it because I love it. Yeah. Like, believe me, I mean, I could stop doing this and have a job running some bar somewhere in the city and making a hundred thousand dollars a year. I don't want to do that. Sure. But you know, you do spend a lot of time away from your family, but I think one of the benefits is now when you're home, you're home. Yeah. And I get to, I, I, so the, the, the thing about what I do is yeah, I'm away a lot, but the time that I spend with my son, I spend more time with my kid than most fathers spend with their kid. Like the nine to five Monday through Friday guys, like they may see their kid in the morning before they go to work. Probably not. Yeah. Then they get home at seven o'clock at night when the kid's getting ready to go to bed. Like then they play golf or whatever the fuck it is they do on the weekends. Like how much time do they spend with their kid? When I'm home, I hang out with my son. I take him to school. I pick him up from school. Like I put him to bed. Uh, 
on the weekends we hang out. It's like I spend more time with my son than the average, like, like uh, uh, than the average father that works a full time job at home. Yeah, does with theirs. Sure, and I mean, and honestly, in this day and age, if you only have one job, you're actually doing all right. Yeah. You know what I mean? So they probably you're thinking of the dad that goes to his full time job and then picks up some hours or does side work or. You know, if he's in a trade, then he does his own little side work at night or has a part-time job and stuff. So you you might not see him as much spread through the year, but when you do see him, it's in more concentrated bits. And exactly. like, if you counted the hours, you would it would it would it would surpass what the normal absolutely kind of nine to five grind guy would. But yeah, I mean, um, and it probably makes coming home that much better, right? Like you know what I mean? It, it, it does. I mean, the 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 like the good thing about <clears throat> like modern day technology is well before we even get into that i never wanted a kid <laughs> yeah sure sure uh, i get it and my wife so, and i were together for a long time uh and married for a long time before she got pregnant um he was unexpected and unplanned but like i wouldn't trade him for anything in the world sure yeah um <clears throat> but you know it it's <laughs> it, like i've had to kind of rearrange everything uh, uh, like I'd finally gotten everything just the way I wanted it. It's like, everything's perfect. And then I'm little, pregnant little wrench in the works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I, I wouldn't trade him for anything. Yeah. But it's still, it's still, it seems to be still working well. And he oh seems, my God, seems yeah, to be an awesome, yeah. well-adjusted, funny kid. He's such a sweet little kid. He really is. He's uh, he doesn't get it from me. <laughs> That's for damn sure. But um like he's really social. It it, it it's so funny when you uh and so many friends of ours, they have these like well-adjusted kids. Yeah. And they're <laughs> they're like sweet. I'm like how did that happen? <laughs> well, you got to think that's that's the, the only way for them to rebel is to to, 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 be to normal to be normal well adjusted people right because we're all idiots and like crazy in, in our own ways or whatever and and so they got to do that to, to that's that's the rebellion right there and like I'm I'm happy the last thing on earth I want is for him to be anything like me yeah you don't want him in a band <laughs> no <laughs> well it's like you know I think about it too like it's weird because like. I've seen agnostic front shows that like you couldn't even get in the door and it sold out well in advance. I've been agnostic shop front shows like eight years ago where there was like 50, 70, hundred people. Mm -hmm. And then now it's back to like, you guys are playing bigger rooms than ever before. Well, not ever before because late eighties, early nineties yeah. music blew up, but it, it's, it's so volatile and weird. Like you never know where things are going. Like, no, I think that I'm, uh, <sighs> And it, it it happens with a lot of bands in our uh, uh, age group or, or bands from that era, uh, you know, where you you go through those you know those peaks and valleys. Yeah, and I think that right now we're in a spot where we're at a peak. Yeah, and you know we're we're realistic. I mean, we're all old. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, and I'm not sure how much longer this is going to last, but you know, we. But within, AF's weathered a lot of peaks and valleys, oh, so yeah. you know it's coming. Like yeah. that's what I don't get is like a lot of people like adjust their lives for the peaks, and then like they want to keep living there, and it's like ain't always there, no. dude. That happened in the motorcycle industry in the in the 2000s when like the chopper boom hit, and all these guys were like, oh, there's so many, <clears> there, was <throat> mu there was a lot of money and all this TV shows and garbage going around, and. All these guys started buying all these big, huge shops that they. It was like, especially guys that were a lot older than me. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, don't you know that sooner or later this is gonna like, come down? Hey, who's the guy? Just they just went bankrupt. He had a big show on television. What the hell is a guy? New York or or Orange County? Choppers. Yeah, that guy. Yeah, they so, they opened up the like a, like like a little <laughs> Disneyland. You know what I mean? With like cafes and all this and that. It's like it ain't gonna last forever, like, man. Who advised you to do this? Yeah, and the old guy, the father, had been around a long time. Yeah, he, not like, stupid guy, not a stupid guy at no, all. No, no, like you know, I didn't necessarily like their bikes, what they did, like, but they were smart business guys, man. Like you got to give it to them on that yeah. end of things, and 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 and. That was just a dumb decision to grow well beyond your means. Like that's just, I feel like that's like, 
So you got bad people uh, advising you, or or that's just uh, you know that's just narcissism, like being like, yeah, hey, we're gonna be at the top of this forever. You know what I mean? And you know, the the father was like a real deal. Like whatever he became, he was a real deal builder at one time. Like he built some some really nice bikes before the television show sure. popular. Yeah. Um, well, not that, a stupid guy. I mean, he owned a uh, steel like, company, yeah, steel company, like that, yeah. iron, iron, okay. something like a metal, something a metal like that. Company. But he wound up selling it, I think to one of his other sons that wasn't on the, the television show. Like you're not a stupid guy. Yeah. Yeah. What the fuck is wrong with you? You know, I think at some point too, like, I don't know. And I can't, I'm not involved with them in any way. Maybe he's just so far from the decisions at some point. You know what I mean? Like you just like don't you have so many people like in your organization yeah, yeah. working? I don't know. I couldn't even I couldn't even pretend to understand any. I think it's just like anything else. You, like you you when once you have like managers, people who are like trying to get money from you. Sure. Like they just give you bad advice, and yeah. he got. So someone <laughs> someone gave him a very impressive PowerPoint presentation he got, that, that he was got like, bad yeah, advice. Fuck yeah, 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 fuck yeah, man. <laughs> but it's crazy too, because like I remember even you're you know, and you probably you know like at certain points like Motorhead would go from arenas to clubs, like not arenas to theaters to clubs. I, I've seen Motorhead in clubs. You I, know I, mean? I have I have seen Motorhead in every possible situation. Yeah, um, and it. it like it, 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 it became like a, 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 a trendy thing to like motorhead in like the late 2000s, like right around 2008, 2009, 2010. Yeah. And that's when they started playing like house of blues again. Yeah, I, that's like, when they played. I, like, I remember seeing motorhead <laughs> like, like empty rooms. Yeah. But I like, I, I loved them since I was a kid. They were one of my first like f sure favorite I, I wouldn't call them an underground band, but they were one of the first, uh, like, you know, them. They were uh, a wicked uh, ride the line band because everybody knew Motorhead, but they were still like, they never got, they had mainstream success without having mainstream success. I, I, I don't know if you, yeah, I no, think no, you no, understand no, what totally, I'm kind of totally, saying, totally. right? But like they, um, uh, uh, like Motorhead was a band that um, like everybody that I knew, like, Punks that I knew loved them. Metalheads that I knew loved them. I knew skinheads that loved them. Sure. Like, everybody loved Motorhead. Yeah. Um, like, they were never... They were a band that should have been so much bigger than they were, but they never got there. They got to, like, like here's the bottom. Yeah. Here's the top. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, like, just struggled to, like, get past that middle point, but they never did. Yeah. And they were so influential. Christ. Sure, yeah. I mean, um, who's going to not say they weren't influenced by them in some way, shape, or form that's involved in any kind of guitar-driven no, like, heavy music, any, right? Anybody in our age group anyway. I mean, yeah. you, you can't deny their influence and in, in, in what they did. Uh, and, you know, they, they had some, some, some bad years. Sure. But, yeah. uh, um, like, who doesn't? A band that's around that long? Yeah, you're going to... You're going to put out some duds. Yeah, you're going to have a couple stinkers, right? <laughs> but yeah, like the late 80s, late, the late 90s, early 2000s, they were like, oh, it's hard to, it's just so depressing. Like, this is like such a great band. It's so depressing to see them in the situation playing in front of like 100 people in a big room. But you know what? Again, <clears throat> a, just a testament to the the passion and drive to do it, like not giving a fuck. They still went on, and oh. then and then you know it's like you said they were, they'd be in some valleys and they'd come back and they'd, they'd hit some peaks again and then yeah it, it uh things turned around for them when uh was the Lemmy movie was that two thousand eight I think two thousand nine like that's when things turned around for them again sure and like right like from then until the time he died. Like they were playing the House of Blues, like yeah. twenty five hundred capacity rooms. Yeah, the last time I saw him was at the, the House of Blues in Boston. It was my first show there, and I remember dubbing at the House of Rules because they were like, "I was like, God damn, like, like I wanted to buy two drinks, and they're like, nope, you can only buy one." I was yeah. like, "Come on, man. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're working against yourself here." You know what I mean? Like, well, you know what? They got popped uh, three times within a, a, I think two or three months. 
And that's when they had like the alcohol agents and like those windbreakers. Yeah. Yeah. Walking yeah, around. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, so not only did you have to show your ID when you walked in, then you had to show your ID to the bartender again. Oh no, I remember. Yeah. And then they would only let you buy one drink. Yeah. So like as, as a, as an operator, it's what I did for a good chunk of my life. Like not only are you losing money from wasting your time yeah. with this stuff, why is this even happening? I mean, how does this even happen? How do you, with modern day technology, how do you even serve somebody who's underage? Yeah. Oh, you know, it's just <laughs> laziness. So yeah. Like, or, but, but the funny thing you mentioned is that the, uh, the alcohol police were on, on point, yeah, like but, but, but it's Boston and Lansdowne street could be worse. Could be the gang unit. Cause oh, those, yeah. those guys, well, I remember be, those days. <laughs> yeah, those guys used to be around a lot too. Oh, you got a bunch <laughs> of tattoos. Take your shirt off. Let's take your picture. <laughs> but yeah. yeah man i mean uh, you know it's one thing um and not to get on like a sentimental journey but you know you like haven't been involved in like early bought well our scenes are kind of more the mid scenes you know but mm. you know late 80s early 90s boston and new york <coughs> you know I mean? going to those cities going to shows and like the the funness and the sketchiness of it you know, they went hand in hand and, and then, and then like even all through the nineties, um, and then just how the way things are now, like so controlled and calm and quiet, like, but like the cities, you know, not only are the venues like getting, oh, there was a resurgence, you know what I mean? Like the A7 is operating again and they're doing a lot, a lot yeah, of uh, matinee shows, shows and stuff awesome. in New York, you know, that's cool. Like, you know, and, um, it's just, you know, it always kills me to walk by CBs and it's a John Vavado, so whatever it is, like some fancy designer guy, you know, that's weird. It's so weird just going through the Lower East Side and, like, not feeling like you have to look over your back or anything at all, like, you know what I mean? I, I hear you, man. I mean, I, 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 first time I, I first time I went to CBs was 1984, and I remember walking down that street and being like, Jesus Christ. And then I said, going into the show, it's like, I'd rather be outside. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. When I was 13. Yeah. And then um, even before that, like if you ever read like Roger's book or anything, when in the early 80s, when you literally had to fight like Spanish gangs or like, yeah. you know, whatever gangs from that neighborhood, just because they're like, what the fuck is this? Like, you know what I mean? Like the early, early 80s punks, like they had it even fucking worse. Like, but you know, whatever. Um, the, uh, you know, the, you know, uh, it's just, you know, it's just a weird thing to me, like the way you know, New England cities have gone like Boston, like, you know, it, and it's like weird because it's like, you know, you miss the nostalgia of like the combat zone or like, or just, you know, going to, to, you know, the rat and then go, going to Captain Nemo's pizza and big fucking sewer rats walking out and you're like, whatever. And you still keep eating your slice or whatever, you know what I mean? Or, or going to, going to little Stevie's or something when the, the Romanian guy was still there yelling at everybody. Oh, and yeah. <laughs> he sounded like Count, Dra <laughs> Count, like the Count from Sesame Street yelling at you. <laughs> one, one <laughs> slice of pizza. Yeah, that guy was awesome. Yeah. And I just remember little Stevie's was so fucked up that they had to have a cat. Remember there was a cat yeah. that lived on the counter yeah, yeah, because yeah. It, would, it would eat the fucking rats or keep them away or whatever. And it was just like, oh, you know. But, uh, you know, cities used to just be more grimy. And it's, it's like and the world used to just be a little I, more grimy. I, I, and I think it's changed for the better. I, I just, as a... Without a doubt. It's, um, it's for the I, better, I, you know I, what I mean? I, I miss... The idiot in me misses the nostalgia of, like... Of course. The adventure of me the too. sketchiness. It's not even the adventure. I, I miss the... like I, I'm, The kids today, and I hate saying that because I sound like a fucking old guy, but I am an old guy. But, like, kids today going to shows, like, they'll never know what it's like to, to, to feel that fear, like... Like what's gonna happen at the show today? Am I gonna get stabbed or fucking hit with a brick or like you never knew? Yeah. Uh, and like now, it's it's safe and hey, that's that's fine. It's cool. Especially having a kid now, I don't want my kid to get fucking smashed over the head with a brick or an industrial yeah. fan or yeah. jumped <laughs> on the way to the show. Then right. again, at the show. <laughs> right, but it, it, it's it, it's just it's it's not the same. And I guess that's. I guess that's good in a, a way, I suppose, but it, it's it's not like it was when when we were coming up, uh, where like there was a real like going to a show, there was a real threat. It's like, hey, you know, you you might 
have to fucking go to the hospital. Yeah. <laughs> after you leave the show. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I, I, uh, you know, and it, it was just, you know, and the, the thing about it was that I think it just gave people more character and, uh, just made like a, I don't know. Some people, you could say it was either a more stronger or a more calloused person. You know mm. what I mean? But also, I don't know, like there was just more like you wouldn't have as many fair weather fans because all the bullshit you had to do to be involved. You know what I mean? Or the bullshit you had to deal with. Like you exactly. did it because it was like really like a home for you or there was, you know, there was something like you were really, really die hard about it. And so exactly. kind of weaned out the, the, the fair weather thing. You know what like, I mean? Yeah, but like, but you know. <laughs> I, I don't think that there really were fair weather fans at, 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 at that point, because like what reason, like, sure. why would you want to be here? It, it wasn't cool. Unless you're a fuck up and a weirdo. Yeah. 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 It was not cool. That's what I try and tell people. Like, you know what I mean? It was like, it was not cool. No. And you got into a lot of fights just yeah. because of what you were into. Like from, from, from all angles, especially going to fucking, you know, the rat. Yeah. Got fucking a Red Sox game coming out. Yeah. Oh yeah. You had to take the train home. Yeah, a bunch of you bunch had to of fight. bunch of drunk trowny, <laughs> drunk townies. And the fuck are you, you fucking faggot? And it, it didn't matter. It, yeah, was yeah. Just, yeah. it was all part of the fun. That's what I say. Those days. One of the funnest ones though that that happened it was a little bit later, but Gore played at the Rat, and we were all like, you know how small the Rat was, like Detroit Gore. What Detroit Gore? A uh, gore, yeah, like gore. Detroit, Detroit, yeah. gore or war, a uh, guar, guar, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, gore. With <laughs> Boston accents run so deep that I we can't they, even, like, we can't even gore understand. Was like the Detroit gore, from no, 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 like guar, guar. Played, at, played the, at the rat, yeah. I don't and, remember that. At all. And we were there, and uh, we all, everyone at the show, because the rat was so small, got covered in blood. <laughs> and then we were on the train after, and then that one, no one ever, no, no, none of the drunk townies wanted to say anything at that show because we were all, everyone's covered in fake blood. They were all just like, everyone's just like, uh, it was no, a general, just, general unease on the train for anyone. You just coming would, home from the Sox games? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You could have had a Yankees hat on that day and no one would have said nothing to you, right? But, but yeah, man, it was good times, man, but... um What's going on, man? What's what's the plan for the uh, – what's going on in the next – I know you got your home for a little while on break, but what's going on with AF? <clears throat> um, yeah, we're uh, we're home until end of April. Then we go out with Sick of It All for a uh, for some U.S. dates. <laughs> there are a couple of shows with Metallica along the way on that one, which is crazy. Those it was like Europe. I'm assuming. Cause I, correct me if I'm wrong. Those are more like European festivals. Kind of like ones in uh ones in South. No, ones in North Carolina. Ones in Florida. Oh, oh. So they're American. Yeah, they're in America. But that's like a way European style festival. Yeah, like, like playing with Godsmack. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, <laughs> seven dust. Yeah, dude. <laughs> those are. But uh. So the South is picking up on European style. Yeah, it's it's been happening more and more in the states in the last like five years. They're, okay. they're trying to to follow the European models. Um, yeah, cross genre, <laughs> huge bands. Right. I mean, that's and that's how festivals are supposed to work. Like for for a long time in America, they were trying to do like the the Lollapalooza thing, the Warp Tour. Like those things don't work for like a national thing. Like you pick. Certain cities, certain states, like put together your lineups, do like a weekend thing. Cause like a traveling tour here, it it doesn't work. Yeah. It's it it, it never worked. Warp tour did well for a couple of years, but like that was the, the late nineties, early two thousands, and then it was like it was a problem. Yeah. Like up until they, they stopped doing it. Like, they, like you can, you, there are only a few markets where a tour like that will work, and sure. and 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 that's uh, promoters. They've picked up on it. It's like just do like a one or two day thing. Yeah. Why do you think it's so much harder for bands to tour the U.S. than you know in the punk rock or hardcore or? Metal scenes, or oh, it's so much easier to tour Europe than or it seems like Europe or South America, even or Australia or whatever, um, than 
you know, seems like bands don't get as much support in the U.S. They don't. Um, so for like, like, like posting on your social media page, like, okay, these are the tour dates. It's like, come to Chicago. Yeah. It's like, well, yeah, well, like if we came to Chicago, nobody would come. <laughs> There's a reason why, you know, we have this show booked here, here, and here. Um, um, it's just American fans aren't as supportive. They they they'll you know they'll they'll say ah oh, like we'd come out and, and like I don't understand why they like you guys never come out to my city. It's like, look, like numbers don't lie. I mean, everything's archived. It's like, yeah. yeah, the last time we were out there. This is what happened. Yeah. Sorry. Like, we're going to go to this city, which is like an hour and a half from you. And that was actually a good show. Yeah. Like, if you can't drive out an hour and a half, then you don't care about this stuff. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, I remember being a kid and driving all over the fucking place. Christ, me like, too. And it still do sometimes, you know what I mean? And, and uh, you know, an hour and a half is, is nothing. It's nothing. But yeah, I mean, it just seems weird because I hear it a lot from people. Like, you know, there's just not as much support, whether it's from fans or from venues or promoters or whatever. There's just as the industry, or what if you want to call it, you know, or the or the world, you know, is just it's not as conducive to touring as as uh, in Europe or other places, and like, even the hospitality end of it or whatever. Oh my God! Well, the like. The, 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 you can't even compare the hospitality in yeah. Europe. Like you, yeah, no, you tour I together. Yeah, like the the hospitality in Europe compared to here. Like here, you're lucky you get a pizza for like ten people. Yeah, um, but you know, the states is just it's a different touring experience. It's um, it's 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 hard for. Uh, <clears throat> especially for older bands, it's hard for them to tour here. Uh, like you don't get taken care of. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's and when you're in your late forties, fifties and sixties, in our case, you know, you want to be comfortable. Sure. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes it's tough. Touring yeah, you, here. Yeah, you don't want to all be taking turns sleeping in the van and right. whatever. And uh in Europe it's different. It's um they're very uh they're very supportive and like they take care of bands. They come out. Yeah. So that's for everyone that's listening. Go see a show. Sometime yeah. in the next two weeks, three weeks, there's yeah. gonna be a show near you. And pay. And pay. Support your friends' bands. Yeah, Jesus yeah. Christ! And if, and if you're on the list, go buy a T-shirt and don't let them know because I know a lot of bands won't even let you buy a T-shirt. Like if you're friends with them, but just go buy one. Yeah, I'm I'm one of those guys. It's I'm the sucker. I give my friends T-shirts. It's fine. But if you're friends with a band, buy their T-shirts. Absolutely. Buy a record. Buy a CD. something. Do something. Pay Support for them. pay for an iTunes download. <clears throat> if you really like the record, you know the new AF record. I I bought. Uh, two of the I bought the um, the 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 one that was from um, the record store in New York, and Generation I, Generation, and I bought the European uh, the European one, the, both of the limited ones. Yeah, I bought a CD and two vinyl copies of my own band's record. Yeah, well, fucking Roger cursed <clears throat> me, and he said you have to buy. <laughs> When your band's record comes out, you have to go buy it from a record store you like the first day it comes out. So that's why I had to go to Purchase Street Records and buy the War Machine record when it first came out, <laughs> even though I got a crate of them sitting in my basement. But I still went and bought one because I was like, fucking Roger curse me now, I got to do it. Um, but yeah, no, it's always good. You know what I mean? And, and, and just, yeah, support yourself, support the people yeah. that are doing the things that, you, you know, appreciate. I get so much joy and motivation and whatever from, from music like... And I'm not even kidding. Like my playlist at the gym, like I'm like, I, like I can do so much more if I'm listening to music than if I'm not. Like you know what I mean? Of course. Or, or it gets you through so much. Like you probably don't even realize how much music, like you know, helps you in certain ways. So support that. You know what I mean? Like you can you can buy fucking dumb 
game apps, you can buy dumb, whatever. You can you can support bands that uh, have given you uh, things that you've needed in your life from time to time. Like, and I'll buy. I'm the idiot that even if I had the vinyl, I'll buy the the I'll either, well or the vinyl or the CD. I'll still buy like the download on iTunes sometimes or whatever, just so I have it in my phone or whatever. And yeah, it's like a um, on tour. Uh, uh, like this last one, uh, like Persistence, or nine bands on the tour. Like everybody's trying to give everybody T-shirts. I, I'm like, look, if you want, if you want to give me one, I'm going to buy it from you. Yeah. So I got to watch your money. Well, I'm, I'm going to give you my money. Like, take it. Sure. Yeah. Um, By the way, that looked like a fun fucking tour. Like, oh just, my god! I just, just because so many friends of mine were in bands that were on that tour, so I just saw all the Instagram or whatever feeds, and I was just like, God damn! Everyone looked like every night. Well, it looked like every night Luke was putting on a show for everybody, like a dance party or something. I love them. And, and then, yeah, uh, uh, but it just looked like uh, you guys had a great time on that. This, this, this tour, uh, this last persistence was the most fun I've ever had on any tour I've ever been on. Uh, because everybody, everybody knew each other. Like there was not one band that like that nobody was unfamiliar with. Everybody was friends with each other. Sure. So what were all the bands that were on it? I, I mean, I know, but just yeah. So yeah, you said uh, uh, Count Time. Yep. Cutthroat, <clears throat> Wisdom and Chains, Billy Bio, uh, uh, Street Dogs, AF. Gorilla Biscuits. Yeah, it's a good lineup because it's got a little bit of something for everybody in yeah. there. And uh, yeah, well, yeah, like it was a really, oh, sorry, H2O. Forgot H2O. Sorry, Toby. Sorry, guys. But uh, yeah, it was like, uh, it's like towards the end of the set, you had H2O and Street Dogs, which are kind of similar. Yeah. And then you had a little more us. melodic yeah. side of things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was a it was a good lineup. A little bit of a, a little bit of something for everybody. Yeah, that's cool. And it was it was great to have like count time and cut through. I love those guys. You know, they're like they uh, they both did really really well. Uh, and it's yeah, cut through. It's been doing some touring. Sure. In Europe, at like count time. That was like the pr that was like the first time. I, I think it was count times for and they fucking. Junior, but I love them. Junior's an awesome. I, guy. I love Junior. Yeah. <laughs> now, you know, saying you know, you said you had a bunch of uh, fun on this tour, and it was one of your favorite tours. Uh, there's one thing I wanted to ask you. You have, you have a long career of going to shows and also playing for shows, so uh, you can you know one of each or or handle both. But you know, what's the best? What what was your favorite show that you went to, and why? And then what was like if you can think of what was maybe one of your most favorite shows playing, and, and why? Favorite show I ever went to, and then yeah, okay. yeah. So favorite show I ever went to was uh, the last time I saw, no, no, the second time I saw Metallica, which was uh, uh, it was my 14th birthday, uh, 2015. It was Lamore in Brooklyn. Wait, uh, you were 14 in 2000, 14. in 2015. I'm sorry, no, no I'm sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. 1985. Wishful thinking, yeah, motherfucker. Right. Wishful Nin thinking. <laughs> 1985. Um, yeah, uh, 1985. Uh, it was uh, uh, Armored Saint, Wasp, and Metallica. There was a problem with the PA, and like the show got pushed back, and it was my birthday, so I figured, yeah, whatever. I'm not going to get in any trouble when I get home. Now I went up getting home at 4:30 in the morning. It was a Sunday night. Yeah, be it you know, get up for school. Sure, sure. And I, at and six in forty five minutes like, or whatever. I'll yeah, never yeah. forget, you know, the, the, the ass whipping that I got. <laughs> Were you with your older cousin coming home? No, by myself. Yeah, for that one. That's awesome. How'd you? Would, uh, how the hell did you get there? I took the bus. Uh, <laughs> would you have to wait for the first bus home? Well, oh, no, did they run all night? Well, yeah, it's you know, New Jersey Transit. You, yeah, you take that and you know, <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> And that's that, you know. And then that <laughs> that goes into the whole spirit of adventure that people had when they in those days when you were younger. You could things that people get child services called on for. Oh now, yeah, now forget sh it. Yeah, Fuck shit we used me? to do. Shit that you would fucking be, you would never let fucking your kid do. Oh my god, I would never fucking kid me. But yeah, I was like, oh, he's gonna, he's just, he's going to a show in the city. It's okay, but it, it, 
it's like under normal circumstances, like a, you know, a 30 minute bus yeah. ride. Yeah. But not that night. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. But it was worth it for that show. Like, oh yeah. The whooping, the oh, whooping, the whooping's oh. temporary, oh, but, I, but the memory of that show is, oh, is forever, right? Oh, I got a whipping. <laughs> it was my birthday. Yeah. Hey. I just turned 14. Hey. But, uh. Show I have a best show but, I ever but, played. But what what was what about it was uh besides it being your fourteenth birthday and everything, what was what what made that show stand? Being out? part of, of of like something that um at that time Metallica was a band for me. You know, keep in mind this is nineteen eighty five. It's like they were doing something different, like really different. And and, and just just being there, being part of that that energy that sure I, I I can't describe it in any other way. I mean, they, 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 they were unlike anything that I had ever heard or seen. Like I didn't really care much about Armored Saint or Wasp. Yeah. Like I was there to see Metallica. I saw them a year before. Yeah. 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 With, uh, with Venom two years, the Venom lineup. That's a way better yeah. show. Oh yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, Lamore, uh, it was, Oh, I know, I know. Ten thousand square feet yeah, of that, like, you know, this little warehouse here. Yeah, uh, but like to be a part of it, sure. Like something that not that many people knew about. To me, was like a really cool thing. Yeah, man. Yep. And, and, and as far as shows that I've ever played, yeah. Any, you know, it doesn't have to be the top one, but so something that was a standout to you, and why that, why that was a standout to you. Um, I'd have to say the, the, the first of the, uh, the, the only living witness reunion reunion shows, because like we weren't a band that anybody gave a shit about when we were around and we were a band that kind of in our dormancy got, got traction. Yeah. I got traction. Yeah. And Like playing that 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 first reunion show, like this is fucking like nobody gave a shit about us when we were around. Yeah, <laughs> and like now people care about us. It was so. Was I it would say. was it a lot bigger than you expected? It's not even that it was bigger. Uh, you know, not, not that it was like not that you care about numbers, but you guys weren't expecting. No, I wasn't expecting. So we we booked. We booked a show at uh, at the Middle East, like by ourselves. We rented out the room, and it, it sold out in a day. Not a big deal. It's the Middle East, <laughs> yeah. So it wasn't crazy. Yeah, but it's still a good size downstairs, like, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's still a like, good size. Okay, room. and that was you know, okay. It's like you guys like we have the following Saturday available if you want to book another one. Yeah, because they were stoked. It's like, yeah, I don't want to book another one. Yeah. I just want to play one show. Yeah, can't we just move it to a bigger venue and just play one? Like, no, 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 let's let's do another one. And we did, and that one sold out too. But it was, it was just bizarre. Like, yeah, we, was, we weren't a band that I thought that anyone really cared all that much about. Yeah, but the other thing is, you remember Boston back then? Outside of like late eighties, like. Slapshot, the place would go fucking bananas. Shit, terror would come to town, and the place would go bananas. Everyone else, you just got heckled. Yeah, <laughs> it's just a little. Even it was your friends fucking heckling you. Like you know what I mean? <laughs> it was Mark Bourgeois yelling "Free Bird" to everybody. <laughs> like that's 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 what happened in early Boston. Everyone was such mm -hmm. a dick. But but like fucking Slapshot would play, and it was fucking you couldn't be in the rat if you, unless you were fucking swinging. If you weren't swinging fists, you were just a punching bag, and you were getting devastated. Like you know what I mean. But then, but then, but anyone else played it. Even if it was your friends, and even if people liked you, it was just. A, oh, I, I remember. It was a bizarre time, man. <laughs> <laughs> it was. Uh, yeah, that's that's when they used to sell those T-shirts in the park that I wanna that I wanna bring back. Um, the, on the front it said. Uh, Said welcome to Boston, and on the back it said now go home. <laughs> so that pretty much summed up. That pretty much summed up that you know the the time. So great, the late eighties, early nineties in Boston. But yeah, man. So um, guys, uh, working on a new record. No, we just uh, uh, after this one, like this. 
we uh we have a a bunch of material. Okay. So I know I know this other one just came out, but like it just seems like you guys are going fucking hard. So yeah. that's why I'm you know. Yeah. How's the new one doing? Really, really well. Really well. Yeah. I do have a bunch of American War Machine stuff written. Yeah, well, hey, man. <laughs> <laughs> Just you know, saying. You know what? It's it, 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 uh, War Machine's awesome and fun, and I can't wait to do it. But, uh, you know, I know perfectly well that it's hard to do when AF's on doing 200-plus shows a year and Slapshot's this year is the 35th anniversary of Slapshot. Yes. So, yes. so respect to those guys. and. And uh, years. they're probably going to be pretty active mm-hmm. this year. Um, and uh, yeah, man. So we will, I, I get hit up all the time about it. We will, we will be doing something. With, I, I think sure. our next show is literally at that festival in Belgium, right? Yes. <laughs> That's the next thing we have yeah. booked. So everyone stop, uh, you know, getting your, your tickets ready to save up it's to up get to Holland, get a, Holland, oh, Holland, 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 oh, Holland. Well, it's the <laughs> Netherlands. It's the the Netherlands, Holland. But because I learned that Holland is just a state in the Netherlands, and Frisia is another state in the he- in the Netherlands. Oh, Jesus, you know, Johannes. You, <laughs> I, I'm just trying to set I the love record straight. I can't turn. I can't. After that, after his podcast came out, I'm getting hit up by Frisian people everywhere. I didn't even know Frisia was a thing. And, and I'm not either. being an ignorant American. It's Me just either. I did not know about it. And one thing that Johannes didn't tell us on the podcast is that Frisia. The, the the kingdom of Frisia or whatever it is expands it g- expands from the Netherlands into Germany. So there's German Frisians and there's uh, respect to Heinz. A shout out to Heinz uh, who hit me up about oh, that. Honest. And uh, you know, so it is what it is. But uh, respect to the kingdom of Frisia. <laughs> I love gold. <laughs> and uh, you know, but uh, so yeah, so so you guys do have a little bit of new material though that's yeah, kicking have, around. Yeah, Gallo and I are always always writing. So yeah. Now, how does it work? Do you send stuff like back and forth? Like files? yeah, we bounce we bounce stuff off each other. Yeah. It's, but it, it mostly comes together just like this last record when we're on tour. We just in the bus or whatever, yeah, just kind of like fucking around, jam out together, and then that's how the songs come together. Now, do you when you're doing that, like, what's the process like? Do you like record it or something, like on the on the bus or something? So no. You, so you rem- or do you just remember the riffs? Well, what we do is we'll, like, we'll like, we'll jam before a sound check. Yeah. Like bounce some shit off each other, and then, like during sound check, our sound guy will record us. Okay. And uh, so you got right off the board. Yeah. So there's no like weirdness with like recording off an of iPhone or something. No, with no, the no. Little, no, no. The little uh, recording app. No, he has his little fancy schmancy things program that and he, he hooks into it to the board and yeah, whatever little, it is he does. A little, but it sounds good. Gallo's magic box <laughs> that he that he that he hooks up into the board. No, it's our, like our sound man. He's oh, just, oh, okay. He's just like, like his phone. He's like, he's like, give me a minute. <laughs> but yeah, they do. Pretty good board recordings. Fuck yeah, man. All right. Well, I mean, I feel like we 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 covered a lot. Is there anything that we didn't touch on you think's important here? No. I think we got it all. It's good all right. to see you. Yeah, man. It's absolutely. Been a while. For you too. You too. Uh if people want to catch up with what you're doing, you want to give out some uh some links for the uh I know on Instagram you guys are Agnostic Front New York yes. City NYC. Yes, New York, uh, Agnostic Front New York City. Uh American War Machine official. Yep. Um, I think that's it. You know, no agnostic front website. I don't think we have a website. Okay. I don't think so. Does, does Roger might. does Roger still do all the booking himself? Yes. He's <laughs> such a fucking madman. He's crazy. What a madman he is. Like that's a lot. Like especially when you guys are doing two hundred something shows a year. Yeah, he's well, he's he's, he's Roger. He's Roger. Yeah. <laughs> Hey man, the fucking more power to all you guys. I want to thank you for coming out today and uh, hit them up and, you know, make sure you buy the new agnostic front record. And if you like that and you don't have any of the back catalog, make sure you go buy the back catalog, especially victim and pain. And, uh, uh, you know, um, cause for alarm. Well, yeah. And cause for alarm. Those are, those are two Liberty of my injustice for. Yeah. There's a lot of bangers on all. I warriors buy that one. There's so many good, so many good uh, records. How many, how many full full lengths are there? I think. Well, pain cause for alarm. Justice for 
live at CV's. Mm. I'll include that. Nine, six, ten, six, eleven full lengths. Yeah, and you got no excuse for finding the new one. I mean, it's on nuclear blast. Yeah, it's, it's every. It's everywhere. Like the the last, the last few have been on nuclear blast. Uh, like Warriors, my life, my way. Yeah. Uh, the uh, American Dream died. Uh, and that uh, dude, I, I, that song, uh, the, I don't know the actual title. I'm bad with titles, but like the hooks, I miss the old New York. I mean, that's one of the catchiest fucking songs, man. Yeah. I, I like, I don't find it like I'm just humming that shit sometimes, or it's just the chorus is just bouncing through my head sometimes, and I'm like. I visited New York. I went to old New York shows, but I, I like wasn't like part of the old New York scene other than a, a, a visitor. You know what I mean? Mm. But damn, that thing, that's a very, a song that super resonates yeah, and it doesn't, one. it doesn't matter. But yeah, man, just, uh, actually one thing I wanted to ask you about as, as, uh, what do you, what are your thoughts on like music streaming services and things like that now as a, as a full-time professional musician, Cause I, I've heard thing, you know, my, inst my first thing is like, eh, there's a, a whole bunch of pros and cons. Like I like, and who wouldn't like, doesn't like the convenience of it. And then you hear about bands really not getting paid that good. But then someone made, I forgot where I heard it. it might've been on like, I think it was Jamie Josta was saying something about like how, like, you know, years ago you'd buy a CD, but you would listen to that CD you buy it once, but you say you listen to it a thousand times. And I'm sure there's records that Age of Coral, I have listened to well over a thousand fucking mm -hmm. times. You only bought that CD once or that vinyl once. You know, I, me, I've bought multiple versions because something happens, you know, whatever. But um, you get paid every time a song is listened to, allegedly. You know what I mean? So is, you know, well, I know the royalty rates yeah, aren't where it, they it, should it, be. They're not, but. The way that I see it, um, and and a lot of people might not agree with me, is uh, recorded music at this point is a business card. You give it away for free. Sure. It enables you to go out and play, tour, uh, uh, and and continue to do your thing. Yeah. Uh, it it's you know it's not the nineteen seventies, not the nineteen eighties. Even the early right, 90s. Right. Yeah. Nobody's buying music in like a physical format sure. any, anymore. Um, you know, it sucks. Other but, than like niche collector vinyl type right. thing. And, you know, people buy vinyl now and that's that's cool. Yeah. And I'm a sucker for that. I, I Honestly, I have a Technique 1200 turntable. It's not hooked up. Hmm. But I still buy vinyl for my friend's bands or I collect vinyl for my friend's bands because I still like to hold the fucking thing. Well, yeah, I'm I'm... I'm the kind of guy, like, I have to have a physical copy. I can't, like, I don't have any music on my phone or, or like, I don't have an iPod or anything yeah. like that. Like, I buy music. I have to. I have to have a copy so I can look at it. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's just always been that way. I want to see the lyrics. I want to see the layout. I want to sure. look at everything. I can't, yeah. like, oh, I just downloaded this record. Yeah. Great. And put your headphones on. I, I, I've, I will never be that kind of person. Sure. Like I have to have a physical copy. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm like that in one way in that to me, if, if someone takes the time to put up, put out an album and to, and, and, and <clears throat> the physical copy to me is a, it's, it's like a whole package. Like I want to really look at the artwork and look at it up close and read the notes and the thanks and the, you know, the lyrics and, you know, even like, you know, just, just crazy, whatever's on there. Like it's, it's still a whole package to me. And I will say it's interesting because if I have the physical record or a physical CD, I do look at all that stuff. If I have it downloaded, even if it has all that stuff, I've never looked at it on my phone. Like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like, like other than, you know, the record cover comes up when you're listening to a song or whatever in yeah. the song title, but I've never like looked at like lyrics or liner notes or any of that stuff on on a on a device, you know what I mean? I and I don't have an iPad, but I just have an iPhone or whatever. But or on, on whether it's my laptop or the iPhone, I've never. Yeah, I think for a lot of, uh, you know, I hate to sound like a boomer, <laughs> but you know, for a lot of younger people, they'll never know what it's like to to 
you know, to go to a record store, like, like, you know, the records coming out and like, now they come out on Fridays. They used to come out on Tuesdays, but like, like I'd be waiting in line when I was a kid. The place that I always went to was a place called the record center in uh, East Brunswick, New Jersey. And I'd be there on like a Tuesday, just waiting, waiting for the place to open, go inside, grab the record. Yeah. And, like take the bus home, like just looking open at it, it. Just fucking looking at it. It was like, it's awesome. Like even before you listen to it, it's like you looked at the packaging. Yeah. Like now it's like, oh, this record just came out. I'm going to download it. Like It's like so, it's depressing. Yeah, it's not the same experience for sure. And, and you know, um, yeah, it's just it's just crazy that that's kind of lost. And cool that it's coming back in a limited sense with like collector vinyl and whatnot and people listening to vinyl again. Mm-hmm. Um I personally always liked CDs too. Like I didn't care. Like I love CDs. You know what I mean? But um, sounded good. Fucking still big enough where you could read everything. I was never a big cassette guy. You know what I mean? Other than you know, listen to things on a Walkman or whatever. Cassettes are the worst format. Like sounds horrible. Eight tracks. That's why all these little like young bands are bringing back eight. Eight, uh, fucking cassettes like demo cassettes I'm like who the fuck is even listening it's hard enough to find a CD player or a, or a record player now who the fuck <laughs> is someone repopping like remanufacturing cassette players and Walkmans it must be because like bands sell a lot of demos again and I always joke with some of them like that I'm friends with and I'm like well I'm bringing back the fucking 8 track man yeah they're, they're not listening to them I think that it, it's just like a uh, collectible like a nostalgia yeah, and nostalgia yeah. kind of thing sure. which is fine you know but it's like it's the worst for a listener, it's the worst format. Sure, yeah, it just sounds horrible. Not only like and and it's like you have to fast forward. Kind, like, exactly. kind of guess. You can't. It's not like a CD or or anything else where you can you pick tracks. Yeah, like even it, on vinyl, you can see the groove and skip three songs and right. You, you know can I mean? figure it out. Like eight track. What could you do? You could you could only fast forward. Yeah, or switch programs. You had the four. Like eight track is the worst fucking format ever what the fuck were they thinking well but that was the most popular format in the 1970s yeah yeah man hey in in the 60s i gotta i my 66 lincoln i gotta work an eight track i have like i have like 10 eight tracks some of them don't work anymore (laughs) but i have like ramon's rocket to russia i have a lot of eight tracks if if it's working yeah i I have a lot we might have to talk about my uh my old cadillac coupe de ville had Had a track yeah man that's that's the thing the black sabbath eight tracks cheap trick I tracks. know. I had a Black Sabbath eight track uh, and and a, a Paranoid, and it it, it just died. Nah. The the thing is, at the the age eight tracks are there, if they're still around, they're, they're not they're not going to be around. Like, I have a I have a Slim Whitman and uh, oh, nice. <laughs> no, it's a it, dude. It's a a Hank's <laughs> uh, the first Hank Williams and Slim Whitman split eight track. Oh wow. And it's so bizarre, you know what I mean? But it's like half of it is Hank Williams. Half. But if you drive around at four in the morning in the woods listening to Hank Williams, like, I'm coming home, <laughs> it's the creepiest thing. You're like, all right, something fu- – I feel like all of a sudden I'm in, like, a fucking Rob Zombie movie and some fucking dirt, fucking horrible fucking shit is about to happen. <laughs> and uh, But, but yeah, but just – we got sidetracked. But given the fact that you motherfuckers are getting a lot of free music nowadays or you're spending – Eight ninety nine or whatever it is to subscribe to Spotify or, or or Pandora, so you don't have to listen to commercials. That money, most of it, is going to Pandora or Spotify. So make sure you go out and see the bands and support the bands, whatever it is you're into, and make sure you buy a fucking t shirt or fucking pen or sticker or something and help these guys stay on the road. Because if they're not on the road, they're not going to be making any more music, and then you're going to run out of shit to listen to. Yeah, that's 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 what it is. I mean, it, it, recorded music is, like I said, it's 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 a business card. Yeah, like all right, we're still around, so here you go, it's free. Yeah, uh, and I'm we're all fine with that. But you know, when you when you come out to a show, just support us, support the opening bands, support the scene. Yeah, absolutely. Because it seems like there's less and less venues. You know, and, and venues are getting stricter. This is actually one thing I wanted to ask you about. Why are shows over so fucking early now? I don't get it. When And when did that happen? And did, did some law or something go into effect? Because it always seems now shows are over by like 11 or, or 12 the latest. When it used to be two, and then the band would still keep fucking playing for an extra half hour and this and that. Like That's because like most of the bands that are doing this are like 
60 years old. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but even when it's younger bands, man, it just seems like I didn't know if it was something with venues or some like weird law. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really not sure about that. But I mean, uh, uh, like I know with with us, um, certain like, members, you know, yeah, certain members <laughs> like to go on no later than like 10, 15. Sure. Be done by like 11, 15, 11, yeah. 30 at the latest. Yeah, I get it. Sure, sure. It's just a crazy thing. I, I've but I've noticed no matter who it is, whether it's a young band or, new, or an older band, over the last couple of years, it just seems like then there's this, like this dead zone, and the club will huh. still shut down, and it's like not just like you can't just sit there and drink for another hour or two. Someone did say some venues, especially some of the bigger venues, have like like they're more unionized now. So after twelve, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, overtime yeah, goes into yeah, effect. Yeah, so yeah. they try and end the shows by twelve for that. And I get it, but the small venues are still kind of following suit with that right now. And I don't know if that's just going on with the more general kind of softness of the world nowadays too. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know. It could yeah. be, you know what be. I mean? It's a crazy thing. If someone's got the answer, shoot me, a, shoot me an email or a text or something. I, I, I would love to know. It's just something that's just been thinking about for a little while. But anyway, I want to thank Mr. Silverman for coming out and hanging out. And it's a, uh, he's an old friend and it's always good to, to be able to catch up with old friends and, and uh, talk with them on this type of platform. Cause then no matter what, you still learn some stuff that you didn't know about them. So again, thank you for coming out. Thank Anything you. else before we take off? No, thanks for having me, man. All right. That's it. Keep it locked. A new episode coming next Monday. You won't know what it is until Sunday night, Monday morning.